Now, joining me on the big interview tonight is one of Northern Ireland's best-known singers. He's also a top musical theatre star as well, and a director, and a producer. We'll find out more. It's Peter Corey. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Peter, thanks for doing this. And I know already this year has been a crazy year for you. Yeah, very busy year. And yeah. I suppose the big highlight, which I suppose you can't get away from, is, is you got married this year in Italy, Yeah, this, you? That, so was a, that was our main production this year. <laughs> <laughs> that was our main show. Yeah, we got married out in Italy. Um, um, and uh, we had a lovely time, just a small group of friends and family and three days in sunshine and thank goodness it was sunshine because before everyone arrived it was torrential rain. Uh, and we'd, we'd, it was everything you want, would have wanted it to be. It was yeah. terrific. So it has been a mad year, hasn't yeah. it? I know you've had a lot on, you've been touring all around the place yeah, and producing I'm, shows as well. Yeah, over the years Robin, no, I mean it's very difficult. But you know the way you have to fill in these forms, like for your car insurance, where they say job description. Yes, it is yeah. the most impossible thing to do. I don't you know because, you know, years ago I would have just said singer and actor, but now singer, actor, director, producer, artistic director, and I love it. I love yeah. the variety I get to do, and I suppose still at the heart of it, I'm a singer. Yes. Uh, yeah. But everything else is is it not 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 a chore to do. It's 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 great to do as well. So, are you taking a step back from the singing now, or is singing still? A major part still, of your life. Still a major part of my life, but uh, I suppose in many ways, just to, I've always been the type of character, right back to when I, I started in rock groups, who, who would have been the guy from the band who would have phoned up to get the gig sorted, yes, to make yeah. sure that everyone turned out. I was the organizer, and I suppose from that, producing has come automatically. Like that when I was like when I was in the, the Les Miserables UK tour, I, I, I thought, why don't we put on a a charity concert each time we go to a city because the show had enough impact yes, to warrant yeah. it. The cast were were not fed up, but they were doing the same thing every night. So they wanted to stretch their, mm -hmm. their muscles and do something else. So it, it was a no brainer that an audience would have wanted to see it. The cast wanted to do it and with the opportunity to raise money and it gave you something to do to, to you know, to, to fill your day when you're on tour. So it's in my blood to produce yeah. and to direct as well. So it must be great from going from being in these musicals then to choosing which West End musical you want to do next and putting it on yourself. I'm thinking Jesus Christ Superstar must have been a dream come true. Well, I was delighted. Uh, it's funny, Superstar was a show that I, I'd i thought about before and gone, no, I don't know, don't know what I can do differently with it. I don't know what can you do differently with it. Uh, but then uh, about two years ago, um, I heard about this venue um, Carlyle Memorial Church and went and had a look at it and just thought for the right project this would be fantastic. Yeah. So um, I happen to be the artistic director of the Belfast School of Performing Arts which is one of the leading performing arts schools here in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland <laughs> uh, in Northern Ireland and um, we were looking for a summer project and I thought right now right show right place let's put it on and I was thrilled not just with the response it got, but also what the cast got out of it. And because, because it is a unique space, and I'm all into performances in, in unusual places yeah, yeah. and marrying a, a show with the venue very much. Uh, the cast, there was nowhere to hide. They were on stage all the time. And every member of that, that young cast, uh, the, the age went up to 22, I think. Every member of it really, really, you know, pulled their socks up and did a brilliant job. So when you were starting out, when you were young, was there somebody or something that took you and gave you that grounding to get started? Well, there were lots of things. I mean, I was brought up, I was brought up with music very much to the fore. Um, I was brought up in, in the church I went to was the, was the Salvation Army. And, and there is no doubt, and I've said this many a time, that the Salvation Army was a great grounding, not only for music, for, but for performing. And, uh, there's no, it's no accident that people like Roy Castle, Bruce Forsyth, Michael Crawford, James Corden all grew up in the Salvation yeah. Army. And your Sunday at church, you know, the afternoon was basically a concert yeah. where you performed every week. So you got used to getting up and expressing yourself through music. Um, having said that, um, you know, I, I did have a great family support, and but I'd never been... I mean, your family musical? Yes, they're all yeah. brass yeah. bands. So oh, brass bands, brass bands. Very, very much so. And that's where I started. Yeah. Uh, and um, in fact, my dad's 88 and still plays in my brother's brass band. So, Brilliant, yeah. So that's, that's how much they're, they're into their music. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I, on the other side of that, I'd never been to a theatre until I was 22. I'd never seen a musical. 
And one night, I, I remember it, I went to the, uh, to the Arts Theatre. Do you remember Arts Theatre in Batonic? I remember the Arts Theatre, yes, yeah. And I went to see, I think it was the Ulster Operatic production of Brigadoon. And it was the first time I'd really experienced live theatre, music, dance, story, characters, yeah. all together on a stage. And I just thought, this is brilliant. This is, this is, this is what I want to do. But you mentioned being in rock bands and stuff before that. So did, did that come before the love of musical theatre? Were you, were you yes, it did. Away that did. That? So sort of around 16 or so, I started singing in a rock band in church. And then uh, the church and I went that away. Uh, and uh, I wanted to keep the rock band. And was it a covers band? Yes, that was. The so, second band was a covers band. So what kind of stuff were you singing? Oh my goodness, what did we do? We did everything from Phil Collins to Meatloaf to Elvis to Huey Lewis and the News, um, you know, all Elton John, you just, yeah. you know, 80s stuff. Did you enjoy it? Oh, I loved it. Yeah. Oh my goodness, I loved it. <laughs> and I was great, I, as I say, I was always great at helping set up the gig at the start of the night. I would help with the mics and all. But by the end of the night, I was, I had a couple of pints and I was ready to party and the guys had to put the stuff down <laughs> themselves and I'd like to apologise to them now for that. Uh, so did you ever get them into a studio? Did you ever record anything? We recorded a couple of songs, yeah. And funny, I was thinking, I was thinking, where are those songs? Because I'd love to dig them out. God knows they're on some cassette yeah, tape somewhere, yeah. you know. <laughs> so, musical theatre then came along after your experience in the yes. arts theatre. Yes. And did you know that's what you wanted to do then? I knew it's what I would have, would have wanted to do if the opportunity arose. And uh, I got into local productions. I think the first one I was in, um, the first one I was, in was Greece, uh, where I played Teen Angel, um, you know, Beauty School Drop. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and a few, couple of others. And... Uh, and thought to myself, how could I do this? How can I, you know, I haven't gone away to train. How could I, how could I get into this? And BBC announced like a talent show way back before X Factor and things yeah. like that. And Brits got talent. Go for it. Go it for it. <laughs> and it was a BBC RTE. It was very exciting. It was an yeah. all Ireland thing. And some friends said, oh, you should, you should go for it. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, yeah, okay. So I went in for it and... Luckily enough, you know, I won it. And yeah. way back before internet or anything like that, where one of the judges on the final, I think was the head of light entertainment for BBC UK. And I, I got a phone call. That went out on the Sunday night. I think it was the Sunday before Christmas, 93 or 92. And um, I got a phone call the next day from this, this London agent called Jean Diamond and called me darling <laughs> first person ever called me darling <laughs> and the last and uh she said she uh, she wanted to meet me then could i fly over and she'd fly me over to talk I don't, okay you know you're very yeah you know she's not sure what are you doing you know what is this all about got, don't trust anyone don't trust anyone just be very careful uh don't know why i thought that but i went over i met her and just loved i loved the conversation i loved the possibilities that came out of it and she said so I want to represent you, and I and I thought, do I need to sign? And she said, you don't need to sign in. It's funny, all my managers and agents through my career, I think I've had about four or five. Nobody's ever signed anything. Nobody says sign. Yes, yes, never so any. Yeah, never, yeah. No, 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 no signatures of transfer. <laughs> so, um, so I went with her, and within a couple of weeks, I was auditioning for you know on London stages for, you know, things like Phantom of the Opera and meeting Hal Prince, who was like. You know, yes, wow, yeah. you know. Uh, and uh, so he's a director who directed Sweeney Todd and he was involved in West Side Story at the start and all of that. And so it was such, for me, such a quick transition from one to the other. Mm -hmm. It was like such a gear change. And, and, uh, and then literally after, I think it was about a month or two, I was pretty much offered Les Miserables. Yeah. After a month or two, and I was offered understudy for two of the main parts and... And my agent said, I, I'm suggesting you don't take it. And I went, what? Right, okay. She said, I think you need to go away and learn a bit more before you do it. Right. And reluctantly, reluctantly, I agreed with her. And, and for the next three, year, four, three years, I went out and I did lots of other, you know, smaller shows. I was lucky enough to have my own TV series in BBC Northern Ireland. And, and I learned a lot of things, yeah. Robin, that if I had gone straight into Les Mis, much yes. as that would have been brilliant. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to learn and, and, and I think in hindsight, and it took me a while to realise, but it was exactly what I needed to do. Yeah. So eventually, Les Mis pops up again yeah. 
And this time you're not understudying. Yeah, no, this time I, I went in and uh, I, I got the role of Javert, which, which is a great role. I mean, it's, it really is. It's fabulous. And if, if for anyone that doesn't know Les, Les Miserables, I mean, it's a, it's a Victor Hugo, it's based on a Victor Hugo book, which is full of great characters, a sweeping story. And the, the character I played sometimes is mistaken for the villain of the piece. He isn't really. Uh, it's funny, I've heard that, um, what is it, the character? There's a character, oh yes, you know the Marvel comics, the Hulk? Yes. Well, the reporter who follows the Hulk around, that yes, is, that, yeah. the Hulk represents Jean Valjean from Les Miserables. And the reporter represents Javert. Right, okay. And, that, and that's, that, yeah. that's where they got the idea of, of that yeah. part of the story from. So Javert, who, was, who is a character who I suppose sees everything in black and white and by the Bible and you've got to live by the rules. And as we know, there's many people, you know, live their lives by black and white. Uh, and so it was, a, it, was a, it was a great part to do and one, one I thoroughly enjoyed. And walking out, I suppose, Robin, you set yourself... You set yourself goals in life or things you'd like to achieve and certainly one of them for me would have been to walk onto the West End stage in Les Mis which is still one of my favourite musicals. And, and while it must be very exciting to do that you must have been extremely nervous at the time as well about doing it. Yeah I was very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> There's a way around that. Uh, I suppose you just felt you wanted to do justice to the show to the part for yourself and all of the above and and, you know, it, it, even with that, it was, you know, over those three years or whatever it was for me to get from winning the talent show to being on the, on the West End stage or in that show, it was still very quick. Yes. You know, yeah. and um, I had to sort of pinch myself a couple of times. But, but no, it, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience and, and a lot of pleasure and a lot of happy memories from it. Would you like to go back on the West End stage at some stage? If it was the right rule... What would the right role be? What could you do now? Well, one that I always, I never got the chance, timing didn't work out because of Les Mis, was Phantom. Mm -hmm. I would love to have done Phantom. That, that would have been a, a, a great part. Um, so that would have been nice. But really, I suppose in a way I was spoiled by starting over there with Les Mis. Of course, yes, yeah. And then after Les Mis, after doing it for three years, I, I, I did other roles and came back and forward of it and played other parts. And, a couple of other parts in London, but I had a young family. Mm -hmm. I, 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 it did take a toll me being away quite a lot, and I was missing them yeah. growing up. Yeah. And uh, I came home for a bit, and a, a bit turned into longer, and then I, tour, I got tours in, in Europe, and I got management, which took me over to America and things like that. So uh, things went in a different direction, and I don't regret it. Now, as far as doing eight shows a week, uh, I think I love the buzz of putting shows on yes, a lot, yeah. and I would miss that. Yeah. And I have a lovely balance between singing yeah. uh, and the rest of what I do now. So we talked about having nerves when you walk out on the West End stage. Before you go do a big high-profile singing gig, do you still get a rush of nerves these days? Get a buzz. Yeah. Get a buzz. I, uh, I'm thinking about doing a high-profile gig the likes of George Best's funeral. I was nervous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was nervous. And... Uh, uh, that was a pressure performance. It was, I mean, obviously, it was a very sad occasion at the heart of it. There was a family grieving, mm -hmm. uh, a father, a son, a brother. And also there was the responsibility to feel that you not only did justice to for them, but also for the occasion on an international stage. Yeah. And, and to be totally honest, singing at 11 o'clock in the morning, bring him home, isn't easy so I was up at like half four or five o'clock warming up to make sure that you know because yeah. as a singer and a, it, it is so noticeable if, if anyone gets up in the morning and speaks their voices down there yeah, yeah. as the day goes on it warms up so if you have to sing bring them home at, at that sort of time you really need to get this thing working yes yeah as best yeah. you can yeah. <laughs> so and if, yeah so I mean it was a huge honor absolutely Honor to be and is it all a blur, do. or do you have memories of the day? Some memories. Uh, I in anything big like that, I I tend I'm not I tend to just shut down as far as I don't I want to just focus on what I'm doing and not meet other people and because I don't want to I, I'm not good at being distracted like that. Yes, I, yeah. I rather like if I'm doing a big performance, I 
go into my dressing room and think through what I have to do. I need to, I need to do that. And I, and I did that a lot uh, that morning and found somewhere out of the way just to find a quiet space to, yeah, to yeah. keep my head down. Yeah. I think the moment that got me was when the coffin was brought in and I had to sing, uh, I was singing the song as the coffin was brought in. With any funeral, when you see this, this piece of wood in front of you and realize what it represents, it can be very easy to, I'm quite an emotional person. I think that's an important thing when you're a performer, but you need to switch off a bit and yes. not let that get to you because you have a job. To do. Yeah, you have to. I, mean, I, I was doing the radio coverage that day of what was happening and it was such a surreal day. Yeah, I well, just, it was it actually, was a, it was, yeah. There was that feeling of surrealness to it. Talk us through some of your other big highlights. What's been the big standout moments in your career? Leading with, with Les Mis, I suppose the one thing that really did stand out wasn't just performing it in London, but was when I left Les Mis, um, and as I said, I produced a lot of charity concerts with the cast around the UK. Uh, I was in Cameron McIntosh's office and I was sort of saying, the Odyssey Arena, as it was called then, now the SSE Arena, had just opened. And here was coming into this new era yes, which was yeah. optimistic yeah. and positive and I thought my goodness it'd be brilliant to bring Les Mis here because yeah. that's what the story's about mm -hmm. and um, and I thought about there had been a large concert version in the Royal Albert Hall which had been a huge success and I said to Sir Cameron McIntosh you know, would you consider bringing it over to Belfast and he said no but we would consider you doing it right. and so I sort of went wow and yeah. uh, so how could I not yeah. so uh, I, I put my team together and we brought over what at the time was the largest production of Les Mis to concert to be staged anywhere in the world with a cast of over, uh, with a chorus of over a thousand. Yeah. We had a cast from all over the world do it, and that, that was terrific. I've had many other, I mean I was lucky enough to, I've sung in Las Vegas which is, is quite cool, didn't yeah. like Las Vegas but, <laughs> but it was quite cool. Uh, things like that, I've toured the States on a show. I've, um, I suppose things like um, my, Working with young people, I very much enjoy, I get a lot of satisfaction out of passing that on. And this year also uh, marks the 10th anniversary of the Christmas show, which I devised. Yeah, which is what I was going to ask you about, because that just seems to grow every year. Yeah. It gets bigger and bigger. Yeah, the music box, yeah. Yeah, so how did all that start then? It started, uh, well, come up to 10 years ago when I was driving home one uh, December evening and and I thought, gosh, if I wanted to go out tonight, where would I go? I could go to the Panto. I could go to maybe a carol service or concert, but I couldn't go to a lovely, festive, you know, West End style Christmas yeah. show. And I thought, right, what can I do? Uh, what can I do? And uh, it goes back to the rock band days. Yeah. And uh, I literally in January got on, thought about, okay, let's do something a wee bit different. And I got in touch with the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum and thought, you know, a Victorian Christmas evening and the backdrop of these steam trains yes, would just yeah. be fabulous. So the music box uh, started and did two years at the Transport Museum. And uh, much as it was, it was magical there. It yes, was yeah. absolutely, there were some moments which were stunning. My goodness, it was cold. Uh, yeah, I would say so. Uh, yeah. The second year was a particularly really Baltic Christmas, yes, yes. December. And um, I believe when they took this, one of the steam trains out to put chairs in, when they brought the steam train back in again, part of the paint had frozen and fallen off. Oh, so wow. so that, that was uh, maybe a, a sign to move on. So we moved then to the Theatre at the Mill, mm -hmm. lovely theatre outside Newton Abbey for a couple of years. And the show just blossomed yeah. and blossomed. And uh, then we moved it to the waterfront where it's been ever since. and. It's what I what I enjoy is so many people now say to me that's what our family do this Christmas yeah. we go to see this because it <clears throat> I wanted to create a show which had West End values included locals and professionals from from all over the world and uh, there was an element of young people in it and it just put the whole family in the Christmas vibe yes, for, yeah. for the time coming yeah. up. And uh, that's what we try to achieve every year. And you have your special guest narrator every year. Yes, we have two special guests this year. I haven't had the call yet. But. Not yet. <laughs> There's always year 11. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, this year I'm delighted. Um, we have Kaz Hawkins as our guest vocalist. Has Kaz been on with Kaz you? Kaz has been on doing I mean, this very show. What She's a amazing. What a force yeah. of nature. Yeah.
What a wonderful singer and a brilliant personality. And, and I think she'll just be fantastic in the show. And a very good friend of mine, Ian McElhenney, will, will be there. And this will be Ian's third time of doing the show. Ian, who over the last few years has been in, of course, Game of Thrones, Derry Girls, Krypton. Yeah. And uh, what I love is, I mean, I've, I've given Ian the call and say, look, can you, can you, are you free? He mm -hmm. says, I'll make myself free. And, uh, <laughs> no, his voice sounds he just better. Has a great his voice sounds better than me <laughs> saying that. So I'm delighted that, that he's on board and we'll have some fun as well. And uh, the good thing is, I mean, Ian, who's a good friend of both my wife and myself, uh, married us when we were out in Italy. Really? I mean, what we did, the, we wanted to do a very personal ceremony. And, um, and uh, so we did, we did the, the city hall thing here in Belfast. And then we all flew out to Italy. And uh, a few months earlier, I said to Ian, I have two, two things I want to ask you. First of all, would you be in the music box this yeah. year? He said, uh, yeah, I, I told you what he said. And then I said, and Fleur and I were wondering, uh, if you're free in June, would you consider marrying us? And it was the most, I tell you, Robin, I mean, it was just the most wonderful personal ceremony. And my, my mum, uh, who was, who's, who was probably thinking, you're getting married where? Who's doing it? What? <laughs> uh, not in the church? No, no. no. Yeah. Mm. Uh, she came up afterwards and just said, that is the most fantastic wedding I've yeah. been to because there was so much love and our vows were so personal and we meant, not saying people don't, yeah, but, it was, but, it was, but it was our ceremony and it, it was with friends and to have him do it was just a joy, you know. So that's coming up to Christmas. Are you thinking about 2019? Have you got gigs lined up? A few things lined year? up. Going into the studio again, I need to record some songs. I haven't done that for a while. That's happening. Uh, I'm directing a couple of projects. Uh, I have a tour of the Netherlands coming up, which has been, gosh, I've been lucky enough to go out there since, since I left uh, the West End with Les Mis that time. Uh, I've been going out to Holland pretty much every year since. So why Holland? Why did the it Holland It just clicked. People, yeah. It really, Robin, I mean, I went out, I was asked to go out, everything seems to happen around Christmas. I was asked to go out for an Irish Christmas tour with the Irish Harp Orchestra. And uh, they were doing a tour of Germany and Holland. And I went as a, the vocal guest. And, um, and we did about 14 dates in Germany and three dates in Holland. And I met the, the Dutch promoter and uh, he, he liked what I was doing. And he said, look, I have an idea for a show next year. I'd like to talk to you about it. And uh, so he flew me over and had a chat in Amsterdam and said, look, and what I love about going to Holland is they all speak such fantastic English. Yes, yes I mean, it's yes. a no brainer, you know, yeah. it's, it's great. And uh, he said, look, I have this idea of a musical, which is also, it's, but it's based with Irish traditional music and Irish traditional dance. And I'd like you to be, you know, the storyteller, the main sort of storyteller character in it. And, um, and European theatre can be quite different. Than, yeah. And uh, so I was going, OK, OK, I think I see what you're trying to you're going to do. And uh, I went over to the tour, went very well. The tour happened again the following year. The tour happened again the following year and grew. They did, they did a second show. And by this time, I was getting asked over to do solo concerts over there. And, and it's just kept going from then. And... Um, and it's always nice to go over there because when I go over there, I go with a totally different group of musicians because mm. it's more of a traditional Irish yes, yeah. feel of music yeah. that I do there. And it's such, it's such a breath of fresh air compared to, I'm not complaining about what else I do, but when, you know, when I do my usual concerts, it's usually musicians who, who have the arrangements in front of them and we rehearse them and they're really tight and you know, really bang on. And when, when I work with these other groups of musicians, there's no music. Mm. Let's hear it again. What about if we do this? No, let's, then another night it'll be different. And it's just a different feel to it. And, and I love that, that flexibility and how relaxed it is. And, and, and uh, I always enjoy going over to do it. So once you get back into the studio, what kind of material is it going ah, to be this time point. around? There's a point. My last album I was really chuffed with, Here Stands a Man. Uh, it was that, it wasn't musical theatre at all, actually. It was, Here Stands a Man was mostly a selection of, songs that I knew a bit, but maybe they weren't overly known. A couple of songs I'd written myself in collaboration with other people. And some songs that maybe people would expect me to do, but it was a lovely mixture. And it also, I suppose I'm at an age now, Ron, when I, I don't feel I have anything to prove. Yes, yeah. yeah. I don't mean that to sound yeah, cocky, yeah. but it's just, I am what I am. Yes, yeah. And I like it. Yeah. And you know, if you do, that's great. And and so I, 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 I 
Do you still have, have ambitions? Is there still things you want to achieve? Driven. Oh my goodness, all the time. Yeah. All the time, I think that's important. And I, don't think, I hope I never lose that. Mm-hmm. I mean, but my, my, my ambitions maybe aren't, you know, what they were 15 yeah. years ago. They're different ambitions, mm-hmm. but, but they're still there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm very lucky I get up every day and, and love what I do. Yeah. But I, I, I would hate to lose the mojo that I have, the, the drive that I have to, which I know you have as well. But I, I do feel very lucky at what I, what I do and, uh, and consider myself very blessed. Mm-hmm. I also work very hard, as I know yeah. you do, and I know most people do. Uh, but I enjoy, I really, really enjoy the, the variety of what I get to do. I mean, this morning I was in two meetings before I came here. Tonight I'm going to the Lyric to see a show by a friend. Tomorrow I go in to rehearse something and then I work with some young people in the evening. The next night uh, I'm singing somewhere. So it's a wonderful mixture and and also the, I have these projects like, like the Music Box, like another thing called Twilight at the Trust which I put on in Stately Homes, like the Red Velvet Cabaret which you need to come to I sometime. will, I will definitely Because they are the one, best yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it's a really riotous theatrical, everything from Queen right through to opera to yeah. Cole Porter to, you know, to Boy George, yes, all yes, thrown into yeah. this mixture and done where people can sit back and relax and have a glass of wine or a drink and, and watch this right up close yeah. and personal, you know. And then it must be great with BSPA watching the stars of the future coming up as well. Yeah, Belfast School of Performing Arts asked me to come on as the artistic director just over two years ago. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's great. It's great to see these young people and to see them achieving what they, and to help in some small mm-hmm. way. Uh, to achieve what what I hope they find satisfying and enjoyable. But the pressure must be on for next year. How do you top Jesus Christ Superstar? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'll think of that after Christmas. I'll think of that after Christmas. Yeah, yeah. No, it was a, it was very special. And sometimes you get to do shows like that, at, especially with youth production. I did one. I did did a series of shows back at Theatre at the Mill about nine, eight, seven, eight, and nine years ago. Three shows in a row and uh, Oklahoma, Les Mis, and one of my favorite other shows, which is Mel Brooks, the producer. Oh, wow, yes. And I was so blessed uh, with the cast. And I mean, I, I, I see that, for example, there's one young fellow who was, was in pretty much in the chorus in Les Mis, and then the next year he was in Oklahoma, and he was one of the supporting parts. When it came to the producers, he walked in, and he knew all the main parts. He could do them backwards, if you ask. He got the lead and he has gone on now to be a professional performer. He's just heard Europe with Rocky Horror Picture Show. So the satisfaction I get out of seeing these guys come forward and, and do wonderful things uh, is immense. And I'm delighted that, that I am in a position to help that a little bit along the way. So we're heading towards Christmas now. Yeah. Give us the dates of the music box. 13th, 14th and two shows on the 15th of January, no, December. <laughs> uh, and how will you be spending Christmas this year? Quietly, um, as always. I mean, uh, my wife's family are in England, so they're coming over, so they'll be with us. And really, once we've got those shows out of the way, a couple of social nights, but to be honest, we're because Fleur, my, uh, my, my wife, she produces the show with me. Um, so, uh, I mean, she's as busy as I am. She's off to Russia to do something in the Kremlin. She's staging wow. a show for the Kremlin <laughs> next week. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so you know, our, we get to work together on the music box every year yeah. and a lot of the other times we go in different directions. So I think we'll just take it quite easy and have some friends and family. And how do you find the whole process working with your wife? Because obviously I do it as well, so it's something you, you, ha- you have to get you used know, to. But you do. I think we've got a great balance now because we don't work. It would have been very easy for us to just to do everything together. But we don't. Um, we, do, we come together maybe once or twice a year to do a project. And uh, the rest of the time, you know, we, you know, we watch each other do what they're doing and support each other along the way. And I think that works really, now it works really well because we've got a good balance. Great stuff. Well, Peter, thank you so much for doing this and uh, the very best of luck with the music box. Thank you very much. Thank you nice so much. Thank you.